This is the eLearning Alchemist podcast. Welcome to the eLearning Alchemist podcast. I am your host, Clint Clarkson, and in this episode, we'll discuss graphic design for eLearning and PowerPoint presentations. All right, so this is going to be tricky. We're going to talk about something that is entirely visual without any visuals. So this is not really the right medium for this topic, but we're going to do it anyways because sometimes you need to meet learners where they're at, which in your case might be on your drive to work, on the train into the city, on a flight, or literally just about anywhere else. However, if you do have more time, look for the enhanced transcript of this episode on my LinkedIn profile, where I'll include images, screencasts, and downloads to help you up your visual design game. My profile can be found at linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Clint Clarkson. Over the years, I've heard a lot of L&D professionals, and anyone designing a presentation really, question the virtues of spending time on visual design. Isn't the content what this is all about, they ask? Shouldn't we be more worried about how the learning is instructionally designed? These are great questions, and the answer to both of them is yes, it is about the content, how the content is presented, if the learner learns, and if they perform back on the job. Visual design doesn't supersede these things, but you should still care about visual design. Look, the design of a course or presentation sends an immediate message to the audience about the quality of the content. The message is either, this is high quality and professional, or this looks like an amateur did it, and it's probably going to suck. This message gets sent before you even say a word. So your content might be exactly on point and highly relevant to the audience. The interactions you've designed may be perfect for delivering the content in a way that helps learners learn. And you may have spent hours upon hours preparing to present or putting your course through user acceptance testing. But if the design sucks, that's the first message you send to your audience. And you'll be working from behind before you even start. And it goes further. Visual design can aid the learning. If you know how screen placement relates to eye tracking or how contrast draws attention, how proximity creates relationships, or how alignment makes the screen look composed or disjointed. If you know these things, you can use them to your advantage to improve the quality of your presentation or course. Your learners may not know what makes good visual design, but they know it when they see it, and they react differently to good design than they do to bad design. This is still a podcast though, so we're constrained by time, and we really need to get on with it. Frankly, there's not enough time in just one episode to cover everything we should cover on this topic, so we'll break this into three episodes. Yes, three. There's that much to talk about. In the first episode, Part one, we'll get into a couple of design building blocks. We'll start with grids. There is, in my opinion, absolutely nothing more important than having a grid to design from. You can mess up a lot of other things and still have a decent feeling design if it's built on a solid grid. Then we'll dive into backgrounds. Backgrounds are a simple enough design element, but they can definitely be done wrong. We'll talk about some different background styles and cover a few key ideas to help you select a background. In part two, we'll shift gears into some important design elements. We'll start with fonts. We won't spend a lot of time on them, but we should discuss font combinations and where you can find some great ones. We'll also get into color. Color theory and the use of color can be extremely difficult if it's a topic you're not familiar with. For many presenters and e-learning designers, your color palette is decided for you and how you use those colors will be your main consideration. If you're not restricted by brand guidelines or if you haven't been provided accent colors, you'll want to know about a few great tools for creating a color palette. In part three, we'll start putting things together with a few design techniques. In this episode, we'll talk about CRAP. C-R-A-P. This is a now famous acronym created by Robin Williams, not the actor, in his book, The Non-Designer's Design Book. CRAP stands for Contrast, Repetition, Alignment, and Proximity, which make up the four pillars of great design. And they're all really easy to apply. So in other words, good design is CRAP. So now that we've got that covered, we better get on with it. Let's start with grids. Grids are a vital tool for making your course look designed. Vanzio Design has a great blog post about the value of grids. They say that grids create four things. One, clarity and order. Grids bring order to a layout, making it easier for learners to navigate through information. Two, efficiency. Grids allow designers to quickly add elements to a layout because many layout decisions are addressed by the grid structure. Three, economy. Grids make it easier for other designers to work and collaborate on a design as they provide a plan for where to place elements. And four, consistency and harmony. Grids lead to consistency in the layout across slides and create structural harmony in the design. So let's discuss the elements of a grid and then look at how to create your own. Design grids are made up of rows and columns. Just think of an Excel spreadsheet. That's basically a grid. But grids for visual design contain some additional elements. First is the margin. You don't want your text, containers, icons, and other graphic elements flush against the sides of your screen. They need space to breathe and be seen. 
Exceptions to this guideline occur with photos, banners, and containers. For example, if you have a full screen or half screen photo, you will generally want to extend right to the edge of the screen. The same goes for full width or full height banners. It's okay to extend the color right to the edge of the screen. A good rule of thumb is to ask yourself, is this element effectively becoming part of the background? Background should extend right to the edge of the slide. So if a container, photo, or banner is taking on the role of background, you can absolutely extend it right to the edge. Other than these exceptions, you want to have a margin around your entire slide that is virtually unbreakable, meaning that nothing goes outside the margin. Your margin may be visible, as in you actually have a line drawing where your margin goes, but it's more frequently invisible. An invisible margin is still seen by the human eye, created by the edges of objects placed against it, and because virtually nothing ever goes into that area. Chances are that you use margins already, whether you're conscious that you're doing it or not. The key with margins is to make sure they are consistent throughout your design. The margin doesn't need to be consistent on all sides of the slide. If you're required to include closed captioning in your course, you're likely going to create a larger margin at the bottom of the slide. If you're a non-designer though, the simplest approach is to create a consistent margin around the entire slide. The next element you want to be familiar with are gutters. Gutters are space between rows or columns. If you imagine a row or a column of three blue text containers, chances are they aren't flush against each other. They are likely separated by a small bit of space, hopefully evenly distributed, which clearly indicates that they are different objects. If your course is built on a grid, that space is your gutter. Gutters should be consistent for both your columns and your rows to maintain visual consistency. So if the gutter between your rows is 10 pixels, you should also have a 10 pixel gutter between your columns. Gutters, unlike margins, are violated all the time. Gutters are used to create space between objects. So if the objects aren't close to each other, you can fill up the gutter space. There are more elements to grids than rows, columns, margins, and gutters. But for a non-designer, these will take you a long way. There are a variety of different types of grids used for websites, print layouts, books, and more. But for slide design, the modular grid created by using columns and rows works perfectly. An important note on grids is that once you've made them, you can break them. Sometimes you want to do something that violates the grid, and that's okay. Using a grid will create visual consistency and give your course a designed feel. But sometimes the grid just doesn't work for what you need it to do. Once you know your grid, then you can break it purposefully. The grid I use most frequently when designing slides is 12 columns by 8 rows and set on a slide that is 1146 pixels wide by 650 pixels high. And there's a reason for all those numbers. First, 12 columns is a great choice because it allows you to easily divide your slide into halves, thirds, quarters, or sixths. So a 12 column grid gives you a lot of flexibility. And if you need fifths, you can just break the grid. You're allowed to do that after all. With 12 columns in place, I add eight rows. Why eight rows? First, it creates nearly square modules in your grid, which is a nice shape to work with. Second, Horizontal divides aren't used as frequently in slide design, particularly for widescreen, where anything beyond quarter divides become very narrow strips. But if you want narrow horizontal strips, just break the grid. Finally, the 1146 pixels by 650 pixels. This is a custom size, but it's virtually a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. The reason for the custom size is it allows me to create a 12 column, 8 row grid with equal margins and gutters without a pixel to spare. If we stick with the perfect 16 by 9 ratio, which is 1152 by 648 pixels, either your margins aren't equal or you need to compensate somewhere else in your grid, which makes sizing and aligning objects more difficult later. I'll include a link to a storyline file that includes this exact grid, and I'll also upload a screencast that shows you how to create your own grid, just in case you want to use different margin sizes or even different gutter sizes. Okay, so you've got this grid idea. There's a whole bunch of vertical and horizontal lines on your screen. What do you do now? If you haven't used a grid before, the first thing to do is start thinking of your on-screen content in blocks. A photo is a block, a container is a block, a text box is a block, even an icon is a block. This is helpful for you, but it's also helpful for your clients if you're creating wireframes for them. Blocks can be any size or shape that fit within your grid. For example, they could be three columns by two rows, or they could be one column by eight rows. In fact, you could put both of those different sizes on screen side by side, and they'd look like they fit together if they're built on the grid. Keep in mind that the human eye loves equal and complementary proportions. If you want your slide to have a polished, unified feel, keep your blocks related in size. If you want to create a slide that is a bit more frenetic, you could include a variety of different sized blocks. If you've ever seen a magazine article with a bunch of photos that are seemingly just plopped all over the page and thought to yourself, that looks so random, but it also looks perfect. How do they do that? The answer, it's a grid. There's a great example of how grids are used even to create imagery that is supposed to look rugged and unpolished in one of the movie posters for Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. I'll include a screencast explaining that grid as well as a photo with all of the grid lines so that you can have a look. And here's a quick tip about modular grids. 
the blocks, again, a block really can be anything that you put on screen, should fill the modules, but not the gutters. For example, if you create a one column by two row block, the one column should only be the width of that column and not include the gutter on either side. The two rows should include both rows and the gutter between them, but not the gutters above or below them. I know this is a bit difficult to pick up verbally, so have a look at the screencast that explains the different components of a grid. Well, we just spent a lot of time talking about grids, which should emphasize the significant importance of them. If you want your PowerPoints and e-learning designs to look polished and professional, start using a grid template. I'll leave links to downloadable grids for PowerPoints and Articulate Storyline 360 in the description. All right, let's move on to what lies behind the grid, backgrounds. Your background is a crucial element of your course design, but with a lot of presentations and courses, the background feels like an afterthought, if it's given any thought at all. For those of you who are less enthusiastic about the importance of design, you might be thinking, what's the point of your background anyway? Do you really need to spend much time on them? Backgrounds play a couple of important roles in your design. First, they help bring your course design theme together. For example, a metropolis city in the background might send a message of business, professionalism, and power. Conversely, a country meadow background might send a message of calmness, connection, and positivity. Each of these backgrounds would be appropriate for different courses. If they are put in the wrong course, they'll feel out of place and send a message that conflicts with the material. Remember that your design is telling a story, and your background should be consistent with that story. The second role backgrounds play is to reduce visual strain. Solid white backgrounds with black text are high contrast and stark to the eye. Backgrounds can subtly and discreetly soften the intensity of the slide and make your design look complete. Now, there are numerous different background styles that are easy to apply, but first, let's highlight a couple of major mistakes non-designers make when it comes to background. The first mistake is that they don't use a background at all, or more precisely, the background is just solid white. There may be occasions when a solid white background is appropriate, but there aren't many. A solid white background is stark and too closely resembles all those horrible presentations and e-learning modules your people have been forced to sit through. They also do nothing to support the theme of your project. Another way to say it is, no design is bad design. The second mistake is selecting a background that is distracting. The background should be exactly that, a background. It shouldn't distract from the content, make the text hard to read, or make it difficult to understand the screen layout. Rainbows and colored smoke look cool as standalone pictures, but they're super distracting when content is put on top of them. So what should you do with your background? Let's work through a series of background ideas, moving from the most simple to most complex, but still easy enough for anyone to use. Your first option is to simply use solid colors. A flat color background isn't a totally unreasonable option. It's not usually my choice, but if you're really short on time or are uncomfortable with any of the other options here, you can use a solid color. The color you choose should be consistent with the rest of your theme, but it's likely going to be a lot lighter. One way to create this effect easily is to simply create a solid background and increase the transparency. By increasing the transparency, you add white to the background color and soften its appearance. Your organization's color palette may also include some subtle colors like a soft gray or beige that can be used for your background. In this episode, I'm not going to talk about dark themes where you would use a dark background because these designs would be inconsistent with most corporate branding guidelines, but if you're planning a dark theme, make sure you choose a color that text will show up on easily. Next is gradient backgrounds. A step up in design difficulty from solid colors are gradients. A gradient is two or more colors that blend together seamlessly. When you look at the sky just after sunset and there's all those pinks and purples and oranges and blues all subtly blending into each other and then into the night sky above, that's a gradient. Gradients can be extremely complicated or very simple, but if you're not used to working with gradients, they can be really challenging. A lot of non-designers shy away from gradients because they're not sure how to use them. I've certainly been in that spot. Luckily, you can find lots of free gradients online. You can find gradients simply by searching color gradient on Google. If you want to use a Google image as a direct download, make sure you have the correct usage right selected. Alternatively, you can also find a gradient you like and recreate it using the gradient tool and color picker in PowerPoint or Storyline. This trick can be particularly useful if you need to create a gradient that includes your corporate colors. Just find something similar and then sub in your corporate color. Some free stock sites such as pixabay.com have oodles of gradient backgrounds to choose from. If you have access to a paid stock site like Shutterstock, you'll have access to more gradients than you could ever search through. And you'll need to narrow your search by adding a color to your search inquiry, such as blue-green gradient. You can also recreate these gradients using the gradient and color picker tools. Another great way to find gradients is on free stock photo sites like unsplash.com. Yes, I did just say photo sites. If you search gradient, you'll get all kinds of photos with gradients that appear naturally in the world, such as the sunset I mentioned earlier. These types of gradients will fit in really well with designs that are more natural or outdoors based, such as if you work for a wilderness supply company. Just crop the non-gradient parts from the image and you're good to go. A subtle variation on the gradient is the vignette. When you see a black or white halo around the outside of an image, that's a vignette. You'll often see it on old style photos. Vignettes can be evenly distributed around the photo 
or more heavily weighted to the top, bottom, or sides. Vignettes look cool in photographs, but I'm not a big fan of them for slide design. The traditional vignette really puts a lot of focus on the center of the slide, which isn't appropriate for most slides. To this point, all we've talked about are colors. Now, let's take it up a notch with textures. Textures can be rough and obvious like concrete, or soft and subtle like a piece of paper or painted wall. They can also be photographic or graphical. Just as with a gradient, you can find textures on Google, free stock sites, paid stock sites, and even around your house. How much do you like your carpet? Take a picture of it and drop it in the background. It probably won't look right, but you've got some quick and easy tools at your disposal to adjust them. Option one, convert the image to black and white in PowerPoint or Storyline, then put a transparent container with your choice of color over top. This approach is going to wash out the texture, making it subtler, which may be what you need. You can also adjust the transparency of the image to maintain a deeper color. Option two is to use the recolor tool in PowerPoint or Storyline. This will get you a more vibrant color and you can use the color picker tool to match it to your company or client's corporate colors. With either of these options, I recommend that you use the save as picture feature to save the image as a JPEG and then reinsert it into the file. I do this because when you use the recolor tools, the image maintains all of its original properties, which unnecessarily increases your file size and in some cases will make individual slides or even your entire project incredibly difficult to work with. If you work in an organization that is hypersensitive about every photo and design decision, textures can be a simple way to get around just having a flat background. Abstract backgrounds are a great alternative to textures. If your theme is high tech, an abstract circuit board background could be a perfect design addition. If your theme is related to medicine, an abstract background of cell structures or the human genome might work well. You can also look for abstract backgrounds based on shapes or colors. Try searching geometric background or blue abstract background in Google or your favorite stock sites. Abstract backgrounds are a great choice because they're a bit more artistic than textured backgrounds, but still tend to settle in and won't distract the learner. Just make sure you don't pick something that's visually overwhelming. One of my favorite background styles is the monochromatic image. Monochromatic simply means that only one color is present, but at different intensities. What we call a black and white or grayscale image are really just gray monochromatic images. So that grayscale image could also have a scale of red or blue, teal or lavender. The recolor feature in PowerPoint and Storyline will let you create a monochromatic image out of anything. Just choose the recolor option and then increase the image's transparency to soften the background to the point that it no longer competes with your on-screen elements. Be careful with monochromatic images though if you're going to have a lot of other images in your course. Stacked images can be visually jarring. They often just don't work together. You may choose to have a different background for slides that use images and those that do not. The last background type to consider is blurred images. Blurred images create a great resting place for your content. If you work in manufacturing, a blurred background of your production facility would make an awesome background. If you work in an industry like banking, well, you'll probably need to use a stock photo. You'll find lots of blurred options on Google as well as free and paid stock sites. If you have an image and want to blur it out, PowerPoint has an easy to use blur effect that can be applied to any image. It also gives you control over the intensity of the blur. You can blur the image to the point that it's no longer recognizable, making it abstract, or you can leave enough detail so the learner knows the scene that's being presented. If you create a blurred image in PowerPoint, just use the save as picture function and then import it into Storyline. If you're using images, whether monochromatic or blurred, you can save yourself a lot of heartache by choosing the right images. Probably the most important consideration is going to be the amount of contrast that appears in the image. For example, a sun setting behind a mountain might be a beautiful picture, but it's probably going to be tough to work with as a monochromatic or blurred image because the mountains will be very dark and the sun will be very bright. As a result, to get a consistent overall color to the background, you're going to need to add a lot of transparency, probably to the point where the only thing you'll be able to see anymore are the mountains. This might be workable, but an image that has less contrast throughout will be easier to work with in general. Before we wrap this up, here's one last quick tip about using backgrounds. Always add your backgrounds to your master slides. The only exception to this is if you're using a different background on just about every slide, but you could have four or five different backgrounds set up in your master slides and you can choose them quickly. This will prevent the background from being accidentally bumped or moved around, make moving other objects easier because you won't accidentally select the background and will reduce your file size, especially if you're using a high resolution photo. All right, folks, this has been a long episode, so let's wrap it up. Here's a rapid fire recap for your pleasure. One, the grid is a powerful design tool that can help you design great looking courses, even if you're not a designer. Grids are easy to create and follow and will bring clarity, consistency, efficiency, and harmony to your design project. Two, there are a lot of different types of background options. Don't stick with stark white backgrounds because you're not sure what to do. Use a solid color, a gradient, a texture, something abstract, or a monochromatic or blurred photo. All these options require little design skill. Just make sure the option you choose is consistent with the rest of your theme. What do you think? Do you think the grid will help improve your design or is it a waste of time that could be used elsewhere? What about backgrounds? Is there another background style that I should have mentioned here? Or do you prefer that slides don't have backgrounds at all? 
Looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Put them in the comment section or email me at podcast at elearningalchemy.com. That's all for today, folks. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you'll listen again next week when we continue this design discussion with part two of three, where we'll delve into fonts and colors. Take care until then. 